Hello, I'm Kamla. My guest today is serial entrepreneur Linda Pulio. She co-founded a robotic company and, and is now got a second robotic company, which is in stealth mode. Welcome, Linda. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Nothing in your life prepared you for this because you majored in fine arts and you grew up in Long Island. Yes, it's true. Silicon Valley is very different. <laughs> <laughs> How much does it parallel the HBO series Silicon Valley, your life? Uh, you know, my recent startup is very much, I feel like, could be an episode of Silicon Valley. <laughs> in what way? Just the craziness that I'd always heard of, of uh, investors really driving uh, to want to invest and some of the market demands is, it feels like a TV show sometimes. <laughs> so did you ever have an investor like the investor in the HBO series who has a card that opens like this? <laughs> We did not, but what we did have was before we'd started the company, a investor wanted to write us a check and we didn't even have the company name yet. So what happened? Paperwork. Oh, so we took it. We just, we just on the spot said, okay, this is, this is what we're going to call a company. <laughs> did you kind of die and go to heaven and come back? That was, somebody actually gave you money without a company? It was super fun. <laughs> that was when you know you make it. <laughs> did you pinch yourself? <laughs> But you also have taught at Stanford as a lecturer, and you mentioned that you used uh, the HBO series Silicon Valley as a template. Yes. That's actually why I wanted to, that experience that happened to me of someone giving us a check without actually having, you know, all our ducks in a row was what wanted me to teach others of like, yes, you know, here's some real life lessons that you can take in the show, and here's what is real, and here's where you know, it's fiction. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you co-founded a company called Nito, which was a robotic company, and it was, I guess, in direct competition with iRobot's, uh, what is the name? iRobot Roomba. Roomba, yeah, which I've used. It goes round and round and does a good job. Um, why did you decide to co-found a robotic company? You had no experience in software, hardware, robots, AI, nothing. Sure. I came to Silicon Valley and I knew I wanted to do a company. I didn't know what. Uh, and I had a Roomba and I was not thrilled with its performance. And I was lucky enough to meet someone who was an engineer background who was planning to start a company. And he said, I'm going to build a robot company. And we just started over pizza talking about, well, what is that company going to be? And I was interested enough. And then we started to talk about my you know, my lack of faith in Roomba and how potentially it could be done better. And that was the, uh, the spark the genesis. that started, you know, further conversations that then ultimately became Neato Robotics. Okay, and so this was your neighbor who was going to Stanford? Yes. Okay. And what really happened was uh, I did know enough about how companies can get, product could get made, because I had an operations background. And so while I didn't know hardware, I was very confident that I could find the right people to talk to in China and have the thing made. Oh, so this was made in China? The robot. Ultimately, the robot was made in China. Okay, so uh, let's step back quickly. You had this operation background because for 10 odd years, you had worked in New York mm -hmm. in the B2, business to business space. And mm -hmm. so you were working with different vendors and getting your product. Uh, yeah, basically what I did was I would have product made from a design all the way through production. And so companies that we would work with would be ones like Banana Republic or Disney or um, most of the museums in the around the country and around the world worked with us. So a variety of product and we would, you know, pitch a client on what the thing should look like and then I would have to go and find someone who could actually make it and oversee the manufacturing and bring it back and make sure it was So shipped. you wouldn't even have a product but you would pitch a client a potential product? Mm -hmm. So you kind of knew how to do this? Right. You knew that you could pitch a product and then you have to scramble at the back end yes. to assemble all the people and get the product out? Exactly. So you don't take no for an answer? Right. So getting the yes from the, the, the customer was the most important thing. Yeah, I think if you start with the customer who says, hey, I want this thing, then you can figure out a way to make it. And that was your secret sauce, the fact that you knew how to do this. So why did you want to come to Silicon Valley? Because you came at a time when this was going through a terrible, this area was going through a terrible crisis. I figure where else are other entrepreneurs? It just made sense to me. Like, 
regardless of the economy, other entrepreneurs have been coming here, and it's always been a hotbed. And also, I love the weather here. <laughs> <laughs> Compared to New York. Some really brutal weather uh, winters in New York, and so I was rather pleased to be able to, to transfer. <laughs> so had you followed uh, the stories during the dot-com boom and everything? You had followed those yeah, stories? Yeah, and I had friends. Look, I had friends that had been here and had been very successful in its heyday and then subsequently like had lived through the dark dark phases and had gone back to New York and so you know I eyes wide open knew what, what I was facing here okay so uh, fast forward so you your neighbor says okay he signed you up for this uh, robotic company uh, how did you then end up going with that uh, germ of an idea to writing a business plan and then getting funded and actually bringing out the product Sure. So we actually incubated it at Stanford through a class called S356. And so we looked at all aspects of the business of, you know, we had a few different ideas of potentially what the product could be because there were a whole bunch of areas where you could automate in the home. And so we did that and then we started interviewing custom, potential customers of saying, what do you really want? What are your pain points? We did focus groups and every week we would iterate and iterate and then we started talking with engineers to say, okay, you know, here's a few ideas. What would the timeline be if we tackle this technology versus that technology? And then ultimately out of that, we decided on doing floor cleaning. Okay, so how long did it take for you? How many years did it take for you to hone in that floor cleaning is the product that you want to do? We knew that within nine months. So really actually why Stanford was good was it allowed us the time to figure out through the year that Joe was at, in the Sloan program of, okay, this is going to be the product. And then as soon as he graduated, we put together the team and really started executing. And this was in 2005? Yeah. Okay, and then when did you raise your money? Well, the first $10,000 actually came out of Stanford because we won a competition that was called eChallenge. And then uh, Joe and I put in a little bit of our own money. Um, and then we, very quickly raised some angel money and it took us, we were raising angel money for about a year and a half before we had our first institutional investment. Okay, so this uh, investor that gave you money when you didn't even have a company name, by any chance were you at the Rosewood Hotel <laughs> in Menlo Park when it happened? So that was from my new company <laughs> oh, and it, okay. was, it was someone who who knew us and who loved the idea. We were just saying, hey, we're thinking, it was myself and my co-founder were saying, hey, we're thinking about exploring this idea. And he said, this is, this is fantastic, I want in. Okay, okay. And the it was new, in San Francisco. <laughs> it was in San Francisco. And the new company is called Dishcraft. Yes. Okay, and it's still in stealth mode. Yes. Okay. Uh, why did you leave Nito? Because uh, Nito today is, I guess, the second most popular product? Uh, it's the second largest robotic vacuum cleaning Cleaner. company. Cleaner, okay. So, I started the company, I had a definite vision of what I wanted to accomplish and part of that was uh, in terms of team and also product. And over the course of developing that, you know, startups change and so ideas change and what you need to execute on change. And one of the things that happened there was we, it's not what the company's doing today, but for a brief time we had considered OEMing mm. and it was just turning into a company that was different and I saw other opportunities elsewhere. I thought I had brought the team up to a certain size and they were very stable and were on a very good path. And so... Um, you left? I left. When was this that you left? I, it was, let's see, probably 2009 or 2010. Okay, so the company just got acquired in 2017, mm -hmm. Nito. Did you benefit from it? Did it no? Yes. I mean, I was, I was an early founder, and so, you know, it was good for everyone. Okay. The reason I'm asking is because you use uh, uh, HBO Silicon Valley as a template, and it's yes. all about four-year vesting. Yes. You know, you have to vest your stocks otherwise. I think one of the things people forget is that from start to finish, it's always a very long mm. period. There's very rare, where Silicon Valley, all of a sudden, you're, like, people are making millions of dollars within a year, and yes, that does happen. Like, Instagram, I think, was a very quick exit. Um, Cruise was probably also a very quick exit. Most are not, and so I think what you need to prepare yourself for when you join a startup is that you know it may be 12 years, it may be 14 years, it may be 20. Hmm. That was in the old days, 10, 12, 14 years, but I think the dot-com boom accelerated the process yeah. where people got used to having quick exits. Right. I wasn't. I mean, when I started Nito, and even when I've started my recent company, where I think both are going to be quite. One is already a su success, and this one I believe will be a huge success. It wasn't about the money for me. It was about the problem that we were solving, 
uh, the people that we help with the product and about putting together a team that I thought would be a pleasure to work with. How are you working with your new company differently? Because there must have been learnings from the first company that you founded that you're probably carrying on to your second company. So what are you doing differently about your second company? Yeah, I think uh, I'm much more practical now. I try to use as much pre-existing um, things to enable getting into a customer's hands much quicker and less invention. Only invent when you really need to. So taking off the shelf as much as I can. Okay. And then I think the other thing, uh, I'm much more careful about culture and what to put together in terms of a team. You know, I think early teams benefit a lot from having people who are like-minded, and then you start to grow upon that to keep expanding out and adding in the diversity. But I think that very first, you know, few people really need to, at their core, to get quick agreement and to stabilize the company need to have um, a lot in common. So what are, what, what are your core values and mission? in this new company? Oh, sure, so we start with respect and communication and accountability. So accountability builds trust and execution. Okay, so trust is very important. Mm -hmm. And was that missing from your previous company? I think that, I think all of us were new to the business. It was our first startup. And I think we didn't put as much time into the people. Hmm. You know, and so we had people, we, I think we experienced a lot more communication issues because we weren't didn't put as much time into making sure that people were aligned. Hmm. So now you're focusing a lot more on getting that core cultural uh, values kind of permeate the entire team. It's the first thing you see when you walk in the door. There's a big poster and everyone signs up to it. We've had investors sign up to our values. What does it We've say? Had, you know, respect. It's, it's communication, respect, accountability. Did you come up with that? Uh, the, the first founding team did, so we spent, you know, a lot of time together carefully crafting it and deciding what the, those values actually meant. Okay. So you are an unusual entrepreneur because uh, there aren't too many entrepreneurs in the robotics in the field, women entrepreneurs, and you are probably one of the early uh, co-founders of a robotic company, and now you're on to a second uh, company. Uh, and you don't have a technical background. You don't have an engineering background. Was that ever a showstopper when you went to raise money with the venture capitalists who usually emphasize that there should be a technical person or the founding team should be technical? Well, with my first startup, even though I didn't have a technical background, my co-founder did. So Joe definitely came from a hardware background, and so we had instant credibility that way. And in terms of this company, because I had previously done Nito, yes, I didn't have a technical background, but because of my history, they believed that I could put together the right technical team, and which I have. So it 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 wasn't really a gating factor. There never was an instant where it became a factor because usually people do say, hey, isn't your entire team technically, especially if it's a founding team? So I have, I have a core belief and I tell investors, and so if they don't believe into this, then I'm not a good founder for them, is that you really, the perfect founding team is a triad, that you have a product person, which I am, and you have a salesperson, and you have a technical founder, and those three is the right combination. Now, other many, many successful companies have been purely technical, but sometimes then people lose sight of the business side of it, and I believe that by having those three different distinct functions in the founding team, it's the strongest teams. Hmm. What were some of the learnings from your first company? I learned that raising money in, in, in certain environments is very, very difficult. I realized that it, alignment between the investor and the customer and the actual team is very, very important. Um, I learned that, I learned a lot of it is patience. Like if you have an idea and you really want to execute, there's going to be a lot of challenges and you just have to keep at it and find another solution. And so often it means pivoting very, very quickly and reacting very quickly. You don't give up easily. <laughs> no. Where did you learn not to give up? I, well, it's interesting. So when I grew up, I was the only, you know, I had an art background and I was the only artist among my family of business people. And I was, uh, raised in a very waspy neighborhood and was Jewish, and so you're always, you know, a little bit of an outsider and trying to fit in, and so I think you just realize perseverance is very important. <laughs> so this is in New York? Yes. 
So you grew up in a business family. Yes. So, so did anybody nurture the entrepreneurial streak in you and say you can do it? Or were, were there anybody in your family who said, no, you can't do this? Yeah, I think my father, you know, who was a business person, uh, he was a security analyst and did not start his own company, uh, always had an idea for, had always wanted to be creative and do something like that. And so he always said, look, you guys have a world of opportunity out there and you should be able to pursue what you want. So your dad then encouraged you? Yeah. So when you said you wanted to do arts, he didn't say anything? Oh no, they, I mean, he loved art. So for him, it was like, look, I have a natural talent and it would either work or not. And so he encouraged it because, you know, he knew, look, there's practicalities of, you have to pay your bills. <laughs> so find a way to do that. But uh, he, he definitely never stopped me from, from doing that. Did you spend time in China too as a kid? Not when I was very, very younger, not when I was very young. When I was right, when I was in college, we went to China and that was the first time I visited. And then after- This was the old China or the new China after modernization had happened? 1987 I went and okay. that was, it had only, it had only been open to tourism for a year and very much was bicycles. Like you did not see, you didn't see the pollution, you didn't see the cars that you see today. In fact, like when I first had my first trip, I remember we got off the plane and walked, went to the hotel and there was a red carpet there. Like they, and we were very much like, oh, let's look at the Americans because Americans had not really been there yet. So it's like being in a zoo. Um, and then you've gone back And then I've gone back a lot for work. And so now it's, it's completely different. Okay, so uh, you, do you speak Chinese? No. Okay. So I mean, a few words. I, I, I know enough to be dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> so that, and this, this was because of your dad you went to China? Yeah, he, he wanted me to have, he wanted my entire family to have a well-rounded experience. And so we would go different places because he wanted us to know, hey, what you grew up in in New York is not going to be the same that you find elsewhere. So your father was very different. Yes. Well, both parents. I mean, I, let's give my mother some credit here, too. <laughs> <laughs> what did your mom do? <laughs> I, well, I'm, I'm giving your mom complete credit. What did your mom do? Well, she was a stay-at-home mom, but she had a lot of say in the household and what we did, where we went on vacations and how we were going to be raised. And, you know, the idea, she implanted a lot of ideas in us, too, about how to behave with other people and how to encourage other people. Have you ever been fearful? Afraid that you I'm can't do something. I'm terrified of heights. <laughs> That's a different thing. When I'm, I'm talking about fear and business, did you ever think that you could not do something? You know, when you were with Nito as a co-founder, did you think at any point that this product is not going to see day of light and that we're never going to be able to be a successful company? With Nito, I was very afraid of the funding. Uh, there were definitely times where I was, where it was a, we had employees and no money in the bank and it was very, very, stressful and so there was fear like hey are we going to see another day um i do not have this experience the same kind of fears now even if i'm under that kind of financial pressure now because i realize i have a much better view of how investors look at companies and what they'll support and not um i i don't i don't experience the same level of fear for my company i just think that it's perseverance and you find a way i think i'm much more practical now Okay. You also help other founders with their uh, business. In what way do you help them? Oh, people come to me and ask for advice usually. Sometimes I'll make introductions for them as appropriate. I'll try to guide. Uh, sometimes I'll show them templates of things that I found that work. You know, a lot of times entrepreneurs, they're starting their first company, they don't know what to show in a board deck. They don't know how often do I communicate with an investor. They don't know how transparent should I be with a, my team and what do I show them or not. Like, if I have no money, do I let the team know that? Should it's you let the team know? Should you let the team know? Yeah, I, I think everyone's in it together. And so I'm much more open with this team about exactly what the situation is because I think that someone may have a great idea to solve something. You, you, you are joining everything together. And so I think the more open you are, you know, to the point of like, I don't want to stress people out, but I just think that they should go in eyes wide open. Okay. What are some of the tips that you give these uh, founders who are a little reluctant or don't know what to ask a VC, how often they should be in touch with them? Uh, what advice do you give them that is actionable? Oh, I just, I say what I do and then I maybe... What did you do? Towards, what oh, worked for you? Yeah. I, do once, I do very, very brief 
updates by email once a month to all major investors, and then I, you don't want to overwhelm them by telling you, uh, telling them every single little detail, and then you want to ask them things where they can be a value because they do want to be a service and help you succeed. So you ask them a few points um, that they can can action actionable for you to help, and then I also, uh, it's good to have competition among your investors. And so if you give a kudos to an investor then and it's on the newsletter that you send out, other investors see that and they want to you know, be called out themselves. And so it encourages them to be active. You kind of um, create awareness among the investors that yes. this person or this, this investing company or this VC company has done this and maybe they should step up to the plate. Yeah, it was funny, like, so we have an internal newsletter that we just started to do for my company, and we do it once a quarter. And so we had five questions that we were curious to let our employees know who our investors are. And so we asked them, you know, I just sent to all investors, hey, can you help out and answer these five questions? And like, one of the questions was, what book are you reading? And it was fascinating seeing that. And so it was fun because then they all started to, first the, the answer started to trickle in one by only to me. And then one investor replied all, so all the other investors could say. And it started this whole conversation, it was fun. So I think those kind of things are, are as fun for my employees and for the investors themselves as it is. It's not always about the money. It's also the other it's thing that- It's about the culture, you know, yes. it's these undefinable things. Okay, what book are you reading? Oh, right now I've been reading Sapiens. Oh, is it on, do you have a regular book or it's on Kindle? I have it on Kindle, but it's about the history of mankind. Let's switch back to culture because that's a strong focus of uh, what you're doing with your current company. What elements make for a good and strong culture? I think it's communication. I think respect, obviously, but communication like acting on things very quickly, encouraging people to talk and bring up issues quickly, uh, to have an environment where you can bring things up and know that it will be listened to and challenged, but then also resolve. Those are the things. When did you realize that company culture was very important? I think what I think what slows things down is if people aren't in communication with each other. And so I think if there's friction and people don't know how to give difficult feedback to each other or or praise or even peer to peer saying, "Hey, that's a great job. How did you do that?" You know, if you encourage that kind of curiosity among each other and the feedback among each other, I think that then ultimately your product and your customers and everything about the company is actually in a better place at the end. What advice would you give to some young kid out there who's probably interested in arts, okay, but like you, at some point may go off into technology? What skills or classes should they be taking? I think curiosity will drive them to read or seek out whatever they want. So they'll either talk to other people and say, hey, what are you working on? And then how would I learn to do that and get advice? I don't think there's any reason to stop yourself from doing anything. Your dad stoked your curiosity. Yeah, I think so. I think, you know, look, I think art in general, like when you grow up in that kind of background, it's, it's because you're curious about the world and you wanna see things and frame things in a certain way and put together pieces. And so honestly, I don't think business is all that different. <laughs> or at least entrepreneurism is all that But that's, that your, that, that's your mindset where you think, you know, business is not different, but a lot of creative people are kind of loath to look at the business side of it because they're very uncomfortable with money. Right. And raising money, dealing right. with money, cutting paychecks. That's why I'm asking, you know, what should they be learning? You know, should they be diffident about money? Should they, how can they overcome their fear of money or this conflicting relationship they may have with money? I think people need to be practical. <laughs> I mean, like, as much Who is practical, like your dad or your mom? Tough question. No, they both are. They both are. Yeah, they're very, they celebrate both. I think that I was lucky in that I had a balanced household. And so I, that's what I suggest to other people too, is like, yeah, it's great if you want to create something or start a business, but you need tools. And so you should look at things that are out there and try to shortcut, like learn on someone, someone else uh, as much as possible. Like, look, uh, first time entrepreneurs, I always say like, join another startup first and learn that, you know, with someone who's an experienced CEO and learn with them and just do that for a year or two. 
and then go out and do your other one because if you're just learning everything from scratch it is very very painful and so like in fact in one of one of the core things that we do in my company is every other week I hold we call it some hands meeting where you can show up or not and it's just one specific topic for an hour so that if because I am very practical that I know my employees at some day are going to go off and do their own startup and I would like them to at least have some of the tools that they're not just totally out blind and like learn the hard way that we do. So yeah. what what did you what was your last talk on? Oh, contracts. Ah, so How you, we look at a contract with a customer. You know, what are the steps to getting one? Some of the things to look out for. Maybe I should come and uh, sit in one of those. <laughs> I would love to know how contracts are done too. And this is this is something that usually companies don't talk about. Right. Startups. And I think I think what it does is it also cements trust in the leadership, and they they understand how we think about our business. So if you're an engineer and you tend to get heads down on what you're doing, this brings it up a level, and it's very practical that then eventually you can implement in the future. But it also it also says brings everything up a level that you can look at things across a business and not just focus on your one particular area of expertise. Hmm. What would you tell your young self? Would you go and do arts all over again or would you do something else? I didn't know when I did art, I didn't realize how lonely it would be. I mean, because you ultimately you end up in a room by yourself and I hated that, which is why I then sought to be part of businesses. Um, so I think I might have been I don't know. I mean, that look like I don't. I don't regret any of the art. I think I did wonderful things. But I think I might have. I might have taken maybe more business classes at University of Michigan, which was like an awesome business school, and I didn't actually take classes in their business school. <laughs> I'm going to switch gears and ask you uh, these uh, prowse questions. You know, a couple of them. What is your greatest fear? Oh, I hate heights. I've, I've said that. I just despise them. <laughs> okay. What is your idea of perfect happiness? Oh. Look, I have an amazing life, and so like me on a Saturday night with my husband with wine in front of a movie with our dogs all over us, that's pretty happy. What is your greatest extravagance? Oh, clothing. I, 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 I have very nice shoes. <laughs> <laughs> so shoes. Do you have lots of them? I have lots of shoes. <laughs> There, we heard from you what your, what your greatest extravagance is. Thank you so much for your time. Oh, thank you, it was a pleasure, thank you. You're welcome. And thank you for watching. If you missed any of our shows, you can watch them on our YouTube channel. Join us next week for another new conversation. Until then, goodbye.